This is a one speaker meeting. Uh, please welcome our speaker tonight, Marco. Marco. Hi, I'm Marco. I'm an alcoholic. And then I woke up and I was shit faced. And I just took the fucking room over. You were all in danger. When I drank, I took victims. I maimed people. I fucked people up. But I had a good time. All right, you're all awake? Good. Get rid of my gum. Yeah, I, used to, I used to do that, Mickey. Um... All right, Mickey, I'm just going to say it now. Don't get in the way of my pitch. Okay. Just keep to yourself. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, I did it. Sorry, right. I'll leave it alone. Right? Leave it alone. I hate being told that. Uh, okay, so here we are. It's uh, just another Wednesday night. <clears throat> and... Uh, I don't feel like drinking tonight. I hope you all feel about the same way. Um, I got a new sponsee who just called me from Las Vegas. And uh, I picked this guy up last week, and he drinks at 5.30 every day. And I asked him why, you know, what made him drink. And uh, he said, I get this incredible wrenching pain in my stomach, and, and the only thing that makes it feel better is a couple of beers. And I said, how long have you been doing that? And he goes, for three or four years. He goes, I had a, I had a couple of years sober, but I just... It's this pain in my stomach. And I said, well, do you ever think of trying a non-alcohol beer? And I swear to God, it never crossed his mind. So he called me a few days ago, and he goes, I had a couple non-alcohol beers, and it worked. And I said, well, now next you've got to try none. I said, but, you know, it's your program. It's your destiny. It's your path. It's your road. So you have to do whatever works for you. But um, symptom symptomatically, I think what, what you're dealing with here is you're addicted to alcohol. You know, it's really, it's, it's just alcohol in your system that is giving you relief, and you'll call it whatever it is that works, but it's interesting that a non-alcohol beer seemed to work. Anyways, he called me from Vegas. He's there for some, uh, some big, um, he works for Sunkist. He's a, he's a, a regional sales kind of dude, and, uh, and he said, uh, he called me like two hours ago, and he goes, it's happy hour. Everyone's got a drink in their hand. He goes, it's killing me. And I said, so what are you going to do? And he goes, I, I said, go to your room right now and call me back. So like 10 minutes later, he calls me. And I said, you got your big book there? And he says, yep. I said, open it up. He goes, what page? I said, I don't care. Just open it up. And I'm, I'm, I'm driving. I'm just left to Klein. I'm driving across 101. And I just said, start reading. You know, and he read. And he, he read down like a page and a half. And, and he said, you know, I feel better now. And I said, and this is what you can do every time you get the urge to drink. Or I said, uh, you know. Come to my meeting Thursday night at my house when you get back in town tomorrow. And I said, I'll introduce you to 20 guys. You take their numbers. I said, I'll be one of many. I'm not the only guy you can call, but you call me anytime you want. And I told him to call me at midnight tonight so we can celebrate his three days, you know, and I'm hoping at midnight he calls me, you know. But it's, you know, um, you know, I've learned so many things in this program. I think one of the toughest lessons I had to learn is sponsorship, which I love, and I sponsor a bunch of guys, as a lot of us do. Um, and it's the most rewarding thing in Alcoholics Anonymous I've experienced. And uh, the first guy I lost, I sponsored him for three and a half years, and he was a train wreck. The guy was just, he was calling me three times a day, did this, did this, did this, do this, do this. And um, he called me one day. <clears throat> and said, you know, I've been working with another guy, and uh, I'm going to make a switch. And I said, well, what's going on? He goes, uh, you're just too busy. And, you know, it brings me back to making amends, or it brings me back to my nine-step work. The first time I started making nine-step amends, you know, I wanted to make an amends, and I wanted to hear how much I really wasn't at fault, and how much, actually, you're really a great guy, and what are you talking about? You know, when I did my nine-step amends, I didn't hear that often. You know, it was, it was like, you silly bastard, you just, thank you, it's about time. Is that all you got, you know? And uh, 
And I, I went right there. I said, what do you mean you're dropping me? How can you drop me? You can't drop me. I'll fire you, you know? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean I'm too busy? I got plenty of time here. I got time right now. And you know what? I called my sponsor. My sponsor said, Marco, you know, it, it's, it really doesn't matter. We sponsor guys. We don't sponsor guys. We don't control anyone's destiny but our own. And, and it, was, it was my first kind of lesson of AA of really learning about dealing with others in the program that what what was my part in it you know and uh, we're we go away on trips together we're really close friends and and I could never thank him enough for what he did for me because it was another learning experience it was another experience that was very painful at the time but in sobriety we go through that you know my first two or three years I'll, I'll back up for a second I got sober October 24th 1991 and, uh, and James, thanks for reading. Uh, I'll tell you, the, the first time I read that was my second AA meeting. It was at the Monday night Brentwoods men's stag upstairs in San Vicente, about 110 guys. I call it the pirates meeting because I walked in, all the guys are like, arr, 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 how you doing, arr. And it's just this real kind of route, a lot of bikers, you know, and Vin, you, some of you guys might know Vince. Vince was kind of like the, the head guy there and kind of directing out the kills and the assassinations. And uh, I walked into that room and I went up to the secretary and I said, this is the, uh, this is the Monday Night Men's Stag, right? And he goes, oh, you knew. He goes, great, you'll read how it works. And I'm not shitting you. It took me 11 and a half minutes to get through how it works. I was like, rarely have we seen a person fail. I mean, like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't read. I was dumbfounded. I was crippled. I, I was a really bad reader to start, and getting sober, I was worse, you know, because much more conscious of everything going on in me. And uh, when I was done, I was beet red in my face. I was so embarrassed, and I walked away, and they jumped up and gave a big ovation. And the first guy that shared said, I've never heard how it works read like that, man. You fucking killed me, man. You brought me right back to my childhood. And, um, Whatever, you know, but I say it because when we're new, our perception is totally, it's, it's like a boomerang. It's so, it's the last thing that's reality. Like we come in new where we want to hide in the corner. We want to like just kind of sneak in, get a dose of it before we feel comfortable. You think any of us are thinking of you? You think any of us are going like, hey, that guy over there, he's new. Oh yeah, look at him. Look at him twitching. Look at his knee moving. I mean, we're so self-centered. We don't think of anyone but ourselves. You know, and when I told a couple of sponsees that when they were new, they were like, oh, okay. I said, believe me, we're not thinking about you. We don't work that way, you know. <laughs> so here I am, 18 and a half years sober. I sponsor guys. I talked to my, uh, that Monday night meeting, by the way, <clears throat> I went through Sierra Tucson for uh, 35 days treatment because I couldn't just go to an AA meeting and get sober. I had to go away. I had to get on a plane and fly somewhere and get to a lockdown situation. Well, it wasn't really a lockdown because there were cabs out front and some people would go get in a cab and go downtown Tucson and score and come back. A lot of people got thrown out in the 35 days I was there. But, you know, when I went to rehab, the, the one thing I was clear about is I had a chance to change my life. I had a chance to, after this 35-day debacle or experience, whatever it was going to be, I was going to come back home to L.A. and have a different life. And I knew that before I experienced it. How, I don't know. All I remember is sitting in my house in Brentwood, um, sitting at my coffee table, crying, and uh, thinking about how I was going to hang myself in the garage and leave a note um, outside the garage so my wife didn't open the garage door because uh, uh, I didn't want to shock her. Um, and uh, I couldn't do it. I was too chicken shit. You know, I couldn't take my own life. I had a 10-month-old daughter, and all I could think of is her spending her life apologizing for me. You know, going through class, where's your daddy? Um, he's dead. How'd he die? You know, he killed himself. He hung himself. You know, all of that stuff came racing through my head, and I realized I really didn't have any options. I was either going to be miserable as a drunk and a drug user, or something was going to give. And at that time, sitting at my coffee table, in my living room, my phone rang, and it was, a, it was a manager of a big band back in Boston that I grew up with, and uh, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he told me how he had five, six years sober, and he just got his whole band sober, and 
how he had changed his life. And he said, there's this place here or Tucson that he went through and all the guys went through. And he goes, you really like it. And he put one of the guys on the phone and talked to me. And, and he basically promoted me. And he just basically promoted me on Alcoholics Anonymous, how great it was and how it changed his life. And I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that from someone I looked up at. And it just made sense to me and it rang true. And I went, all right. And, and Bob T., um, showed up at my doorstep the next day because my friend Tim C., who's my Eskimo, basically said, there's this guy Bob T. in L.A. who he'll come see in the next 24 hours. He'll help you out. <laughs> and Bob T. or Timmons um, showed up at my doorstep, and I thought, who the fuck is this guy at my doorstep? He was tattooed from his, from his neck down, you know, with Aryan Nation plastered across his chest. I mean, just a stone-cold hard ass guy and you know Bob if you knew Bob at all he really spoke very soft you know but you know I had heard his story you know I had known what he had done you know and uh, the time he had served and you know how he handled himself in that scenario so I knew the guy was ultra scary if I wasn't willing to do what he said and uh, <laughs> he convinced me to get on this plane to Tucson the next day which I did and, and uh, it was funny that the day before I went away, I went to a friend's house and uh, sitting up in his bedroom and I was smoking a half a joint and I had like a Bud Light in my hand and I remember just putting it down and taking a half a joint and dropping it in the can and my buddy said, what are you doing? I said, I'm done. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to rehab tomorrow. I'm going to get sober. He went, oh, okay. So you don't want any more of my Coke then? I said, yeah. And he goes, good. You know, and... Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I really, I was really kind of just done. You know, I was done with the whole thing. My life was starting to fall apart, and I knew I had to change. So here I go off to Tucson. I do my 35 days, and, and Tim C., my Eskimo, had given me an envelope, a letter, and he said, I want you to open it when you get there, and not till you get there in your room. So I got my room unpacked and opened it up, and the letter basically said, you have a chance in the next 35 days to change your life, and it was that simple. He said, just do yourself a favor. Don't sit in the back of the room. Don't start fucking around and playing games. He goes, sit up front and listen and learn. He said, so you have some knowledge when you get back home and you can live a sober life and you can, your dreams are unlimited. I mean, basically, that's what it said. And, um, you know, I get back to L.A. It was my natal birthday that day. It was a, a Saturday. And... Uh, it was November 24th, the 25th, and, uh, and I'm laying on the couch, and my wife goes, so you're going to a meeting tonight, right? And I said, well, yeah, I can go to one tomorrow. I don't have to go to one tonight. And he goes, wait a minute, what, what happened to 90 meetings in 90 days? Didn't you sign a contract when you're in rehab that you're going to do that, Mr. Big AA? I thought you were going to go to a meeting every day and give me all the shit. And I went, all right, fine. Now, where I lived in Brentwood at Sunset and Bundy, directly across the street is a, uh, a school that has an old-timers meeting there on Saturday nights. It's a very small meeting, but, I mean, it's across the street. So I get out and I get in my car. <laughs> and I drive up to a Starbucks or somewhere and get a coffee, and, you know, I'm, I'm diddling around and, you know, driving around the neighborhood looking at storefronts and, you know. <sighs> Finally get back to my house and park my car and walk across the street into the meeting. And uh, I get into the meeting, and uh, there's about 15 people there. And, you know, I'm old now, but, I mean, at the time, they were really old to me. You know, it was definitely an old-timers meeting. And I think the younger sobriety was like 15 years. And uh, I walk in and sat down, and I said, this is the Saturday night meeting. And once again, busted. And he goes, oh, so you're new. Great. Great. And the meeting was about me. They talked to me all 13 or 14 of them, every one of the shares, and it was, it was round robin where they go around, the meeting ends at the last share. And they all directed their conversation to me. It was basically, this is how we got sober and you can do it too. You know, so I directed to you, James, and I directed to you, Mike, and I directed to all you guys and women that uh, stood up and qualified as new, and if you didn't, I didn't at first either. That Monday night men's uh, stag meeting, they asked whoever's got under 30 days, raise your hand. And the guys stood up, and, they, and I was sitting on both my hands because I wasn't ready to give it up. You know, and I watched on the coffee break. Those guys get surrounded, got handed cards. They were going out having coffee or dinner afterwards. And I realized, once again, knock the shit off. I can't do this. And I couldn't wait to get back there the next Monday night. They said, has anyone got? And my hand was up. I just wanted to qualify. I wanted to be part of the gang. And that's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. So if you're new, boo, okay? 
That's as bad as it gets. It doesn't get any scarier, you know. <laughs> Anything you're afraid of in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're afraid because you don't know yet. And I get that. Because when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, they were talking about these 12 steps. Now, I lived over in Santa Monica, too, on uh, right off of the 4th Street steps. And, of course, I'm thinking steps. It must be those special steps. It's 12 of those sons of bitches that you got to hang near or something. Like, what are the, what are the ste what steps? Where? What town? Where are they? You know? And, and how do you know about Alcoholics Anonymous? Do you come in and go to some meetings and sit and listen? You know, and talk to other alcoholics and, and find out how this thing really works. You know, I mean, easy does it. Let go and let God, you know, one day at a time. There's a million of them. I mean, Mickey's got 2,000 of them, but I, I can't remember them all. Uh, my favorite one was uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. is a million-dollar program shoved up your ass a nickel at a time. And sometimes it really feels that way. Because some days, some days I'm just watching that second-hand click through each second. And lately, my days, I mean, I'm getting up and it's nighttime already. You know, they're just, they're flying. You know, and, um, you know, I have so many fond memories in my 18 and a half years of sobriety. Um, when I was five years sober, uh, I was invited up to uh, Bill Wilson's house that he was born in up in East Dorset, Vermont, and I made a point to go there every year for 10, 10 or 12 years in a row. And I missed the last uh, three years. I'm going back again this October. We go in the leaves change. There's about 20 of us, half from Boston, half from LA, that get together and we go up for an intensive 12 step study. And um, if you haven't been there, the, the Wilson house up there in East Dorset, Vermont, um, it's a 10-bedroom bed-and-breakfast house where they have uh, people from the program come and donate their time to either change beds or be the cook for a week. They come in and donate a week of their time and work the house. And it's really awesome there because uh, the 20 of us would get together on a Thursday night, introduce ourselves, have a little round-robin quick meeting, and we'd start Friday morning going through the steps. And by Friday night, uh, we'd each grab someone to do our fifth step with and and by Saturday morning, we're into 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And uh, by Saturday night, um, we do the 11th step. Uh, we'd walk up the street to this brook and have a meditation, uh, little 20-minute meditation, and come back and do step 11 and then do 12 and finish up Saturday night and go out into the town for a big dinner. And uh, I never had so much fun in my life. I, I'd heard about all these, like, you know, go away for these retreats, and there's a ton of them everywhere. And, especially out here in Southern California. But uh, that's something that I, I realized that I started looking at every year of my sobriety. I had something to do, somewhere to go at various times of the year, that whether it was the AA picnic where I could get up and jam with the bands, or if it was going to the Wilson House and, and the leaf change in October, whether it was going to this Christmas retreat I go to. You know, I found myself, you know, through the year having different, you know, kind of time marks, you know, like little bookmarks of my sobriety that became yearly events, annual events. Um, and that's, that's some of the stuff some of us, you know, get to experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, and it's really helped me. It's worked for me. You know, it's kept, helped keep me sober. Um, I have, uh, I have a, a brother who's four years older than me, and uh, he's, got about 20, he's got about 20 years sober, and he stopped going to meetings about six years ago. And uh, he was a circuit speaker, huge AA. One day just stopped. Don't want to go to meetings anymore. And uh, he lives down, the, down Cape Cod outside of Boston, and all he does is go to his job all day, Hayton comes home, plays golf on weekends. He's bent more golf clubs and threw more golf clubs into the pond, into the lake, wherever he plays. And the guy's just downright angry. All he does is curse. All he does is go out and say, fuck, he's miserable. You know, my mother would say things to me like, what do you think's wrong with your brother? <laughs> I know what's wrong with him, you know. But what am I going to tell him? What am I going to teach him? You know, we, we've had conversations on the phone, and he doesn't want to talk to me so much now. You know, and that's, that's his path. 
that's his deal. You know, and I've got a sister who's a year older than me. She's got uh, about a year less than me. Uh, I got a, a sister who's a practicing alcoholic who, God willing, someday will get it, but she's, she, her life is working for her. And I got a crackhead sister who is so bad, um, she goes to rehab for five days, comes out, you know, uses, and, you know, wonders why she can't get sober. Um, Call me from a meeting down in the Cape last week and just threw about three people's anonymity out over the phone. You're not going to believe who I'm here with, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, hmm. Yeah. Um, my mother had to change the locks at her house because she, uh, she started stealing her jewelry. Jewelry started missing. And uh, my mother found a, a bunch of empty bottles of booze uh, in her trash, and she blamed the uh, custodian at the at the building she lives in because he was watching over her cat and he thought she was taking her booze and you know drinking it and throwing empty bottles in there and I guess my sister finally came clean to her and told her she was on her lunch break going over and killing a bottle of booze a bottle and um, I got a call from my brother last Thursday night and uh, she just lost her fourth dr job drunk on the job and she left after getting fired and went and bought a bottle of tequila, started drinking it, got pulled over by the cops, got arrested, same old behavior. Her husband came to get her out of jail, pick her up with her 17-year-old uh, daughter. And uh, on the way home, had a fight, pulled the car over, let me out, got out, give me my pocketbook. Her daughter threw it out and the cell phone flew out and smashed in pieces and started yelling at him. Her daughter got out and sucker punched and knocked her out. <laughs> just knocked a cold out just like I fucking hate you this is what this drug does to you mother and um, you know the cops came and found my sister lying unconscious on the ground and she filed a report and had her daughter arrested this is what happens folks this is what we do when we use this is the path we take and it goes nowhere but down there's no win stories in drug use I mean, I don't know about you, but I haven't heard anyone come in lately and go, you got to go out and try this. It's really good, you know. It just, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't. And, you know, and through Alcoholics Anonymous, we learn, we learn ways to stay sober and change our life. And, and, uh, and Amanda, thank you for reading, too. Um, you know, I want to say I spilt more booze on my shoes than you drank, but honestly, I spilt more booze on my shoes than you weigh. Uh, <laughs> Because I was a pretty sloppy drunk. <clears throat> What's the booze? What's up with the fucking booze? Hey, all right, I'm done. Huh? No. No. I like the mic. Um, but thank you. Appreciate it. And welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a great program. Um, how much time do I got? Another hour. Another hour? Uh, seriously, what time do I wrap up? Ten to, Ten to nine. Beautiful. Ten minutes. Um, my life, my life and my sobriety. I've, a lot of things have happened in my 18 and a half years. I was very fortunate, uh, I believe, when I got sober, that uh, I, got, I got struck sober. You know, like I got it. You know, whether it was Sierra Tucson, the 35 day, days away, whatever it was, I got it because I haven't had the chance or opportunity or, or you know, blissful enough moment that uh, I had the urge to go out and try this thing again, you know. And, and honestly, I don't know why that is. I can point to a number of different things from having a sponsor and working with guys and, and doing this and doing that and, and going to lots of meetings. But I don't know. I, I see people would, would 18, 20, 25 years go out, you know, and – why them, not me? And Tim C., my Eskimo, told me once, he goes, we're the lucky fuckers. He goes, you know, for whatever reason, we've been lucky to stay sober. And, and, and it really is one day at a time. Sometimes it's one hour at a time. And, you know, I've had plenty of difficulty in sobriety. I, I lost uh, um, my wife died a year and a half ago from stage four breast cancer. And uh, that, was, that was the toughest thing I've gone through in my sobriety because we were... We were together 10 years, and she was the one. I'll never find another one. I know that. I know it absolutely as I'm speaking to you right now. She was my soulmate, whatever you want to call it. 
she had a funny bone bigger than Philadelphia. You know, she was a uh, comedian. And uh, just she was she was number one in my wheelhouse. She was just what worked for me. And uh, she also was sober. She had she had seven years and decided to go out and have a beer one day. And, you know, two years later, drifted back into the rooms. And uh, she died sober with, uh, I think, 13 years. Um, but in her bout with cancer, she fought stage four cancer, breast cancer, for uh, five years. And they gave her two when they found it. It metastasized throughout her body, through all her bones. Um, and they said, you probably have two years. And, and she was going to be the test case for the success story of, of cancer treatment, of breast cancer. Because she, every chemo they put her on, she lasted at least three times longer. She was beating this thing. And she developed like a polyp in her throat, and it was uh, irritating her. So they went down with a scope to biopsy it, and they pulled the scope out, and they said, you got 20 tumors in your lungs. And she said, okay, I'm done. She goes, I'm not going to die in a chemo ward. I've done it for five years. I can't beat this thing. And it was the right call. She was done. And, um, you know, I went to uh, my employer, and I told him that I wasn't going to be working for, the, for a while. I was going to spend the rest of my days at home with her. And basically... Um, I was the in-house nurse for her for the next um, three months before she passed away. And um, I was giving her morphine and liquid morphine injections every two hours uh, after about the first month for the last two months. And, uh, well, actually it was probably every six hours, but, uh, you know, it got quicker near the end. And uh, it was the most powerful experience I've ever gone through in my life, and thank God I was sober, because that morphine would have disappeared real, real quick. And she would have been laying there in pain, and I would have just been nodding out, you know, having a good old time, selfish me. Um, so, um, you know, I had to uh, drain her lung every day. I had to uh, change her IV daily. You know, I just became an in-house nurse, and. Uh, it was, it was such an awesome experience. Now, it sounds weird saying that because I'm watching my, my, my other half die. And, uh, but to be sober and be there for someone like that, you can never experience a more powerful situation because I was so there for her. And only because of being sober was I there for her. And, uh, you know, I was thinking the last three weeks of uh, her life how I was going to go out. <laughs> You know, I figured when she takes her last breath, I'm going to finish off the morphine. I'm going to make a couple calls. I'm going to score a shitload of dope. I'm going to get a bunch of ice cold vodka, and I'm going to be on my way. And if I come back, that's great, but I'm going to go out for a while. I'm just going to go take a little journey. And uh, the moment she took her last breath, the last thing on my mind was getting high. I felt so honored to be there and be there with her and go through that experience, uh, now get high, now drink. There was just no solution in that, that equation. It just didn't make sense at all. So uh, her memorial um, was at the Self-Realization Center. And uh, th there was about 1,000 people there. and. Um, when we eulogized her, there were five eulogies that were, I mean, I, I wish they, w they won't allow videotape or recording in there, and it kills me because they're, what was said was so magical. And Kenny Rankin got up and played a song. He died of cancer a few months ago. Um, Doug Figer got up and played a song. He died a month ago, two months ago, cancer. And uh, Doug and my wife and I used to go for Indian food every Saturday night for a year and a half before before she died. And uh, we'd drive home every night. My w wife would say, poor Doug, he's not going to make it. He's going to go long before me. And he lasted a year and a half after her. Um, and he also was a spiritual giant, you know, a guy who really walked the walk and talked the talk. And, um, you know, I've come to learn that in Alcoholics Anonymous probably more than anything. Um, I'm no better than any other man in this room, and I know that for a fact but I know how comfortable I am in my skin, and there's only one reason I'm that way, and that's because I go to five to six or seven meetings a week, 
you know, and I talk to my sponsor, and I sponsor guys, and I go through the steps. I have a step study at my house every Thursday night with about 15, 20 guys, and it's one of the most intimate settings of experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the shares that come out of these guys, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, Emil, thank you for being here. Emil's one of my sponsees, and uh, I took Emil on when he was brand new, and uh, I had to take a fucking crowbar to get a word out of son of a bitch. It was like, come on, talk to me. And now I can't shut him up, you know. And that's what we do. We open up. We blossom in this program. You know, we become human again. You know, we just, the lights go on. The machinery starts working. You know, I worked in the music business 30 years. I found, I found it better making money in it than playing in it. And, uh, and I changed careers 10 years ago. I do a totally different form of business now. And I make plenty of money, but it's not about that. I, I enjoy what I do, but I'm also playing in a band now. I'm doing something I wanted to do my whole life, and I'm doing it sober now. And we are just killing it. You know what I mean? I've found ways, once again, that we, we can do anything we want. Ten years ago when I sat down seven and a half years sober, and I said, you know what? I'm done with this business. I'm down, done with making so much money. I don't feel like I'm even earning it. And there's a bunch of scumbags in it, too. And I just don't want to deal with these people anymore. You know, no offense if anyone's in the music business here, but, you know, it just, it's a slippery, it's a slippery slope. And um, like I said, I just, I, I drummed up a new me. You know, we do that in sobriety. If, if you're sitting here and you've had thoughts about changing careers or doing something else, I swear to God, if you believe in yourself, you can do it and it will work. And that's due to Alcoholics Anonymous and nothing else. No, no magic potion, you know. We go to meetings, we call our sponsor, we work with others. That's all we have to do. And, um, and happy birthday to the birthday. Hector, happy three, and who was the six? Jackie. Jackie, Jackie, happy birthday. God bless you. And uh, I love this program, and you know, I, I'm, you know, I used to tell people all the time, keep coming back, and I don't say that anymore. I just say stay. Thanks for letting me speak.